So everyone knows the history of this revolution that Boston helped kick off in the 1770s, the one with the crates of tea and the lanterns and the red coats. But I want to talk about seven other revolutions that Boston helped start, scientific and technological revolutions. And these, I would argue, formed our identity as a city and really can guide us as we think about what our mission is in the global economy of the 21st century. So I want to start by talking about a rivalry. <laughs> and this is teeing it up for our friend from the Red Sox uh, in just a few minutes. But uh, the rivalry I want to talk about is not Red Sox versus Yankees or Patriots versus Giants. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a rivalry that started a few decades before the Red Sox or Yankees even existed in the 1860s. And back then, Boston and New York were the center of action and were kind of vying to see which was going to be the leading city of the telegraph era. The telegraph, of course, was the cutting edge communication uh, medium of the day. It was invented by Samuel Morse, who was born not far from here in Charlestown, Massachusetts. And uh, there was just a lot of action in terms of what was version two and version three of telegraph technology going to be, both in Boston and in New York. And one of the problems they were trying to solve was how do you get more bandwidth out of a telephone wire? Uh, you know, what's broadband telegraph going to be like? How can we send lots of messages down the telegraph wire uh, at the same time? And so if you were in Boston in the 1860s and 1870s, you could have visited this building in the center at 109 Court Street. Uh, if you've ever taken the T to Government Center or gone to City Hall in Boston, this building was right uh, near there. And the first floor was a, tele a telegraph equipment supply shop. But up above was kind of Boston's first incubator, Boston's first co-working space, where there were a lot of inventors and entrepreneurs who were thinking about what's next for the telegraph. And among the people who worked in that upstairs incubator space were uh, Thomas Edison there on the bottom left. He actually started his career in Boston before he had a, a falling out with his investors and left uh, sheepishly and moved to New Jersey. Um, <laughs> Above him is Thomas Watson. He was an assistant to Alexander Graham Bell, a Boston University professor, who had this crazy idea of like, hey, we're stringing up all these telegraph wires around the country. What if you could communicate and send voice down the telegraph wire? So he invented the telephone. And this red brick building, you can still see this uh, just outside of Central Square on Main Street in Cambridge. One day in 1876, Thomas Watson went to that building. Alexander Graham Bell was in the building I just showed you on Court Street. And they made the first long distance two-way telephone call all the way from Boston uh, to Cambridge. Unfortunately, I think history has lost what the call was about. I think maybe Alexander Graham Bell was trying to sell Watson some timeshares and Watson quickly hung up. And uh, everything has gone downhill from there uh, when it comes to answering the phone. But so revolution number one is the telecommunications industry. Right now, in 2015, there are 7 billion people or so on the planet Earth, and 6.8 billion of them have a phone. And Boston's contributions didn't just stop with Alexander Graham Bell uh, and his friend Watson. But in 2003, there was this company called Android that was founded. Uh, and one of the two founders was here, a Cambridge entrepreneur named Rich Miner. Uh, and their idea was to develop a new operating system that could work on all kinds of different mobile phones. They were pretty quickly acquired by Google and then became the Android operating system that, can I see the Android people out in the crowd? A lot of Android people. How about the iPhone people out in the crowd? So when Apple introduced Siri, the, the speech recognition and artificial intelligence tool, um, that original technology was developed by Nuance Communications here in the Boston area. Uh, and uh, Apple actually now has a small advanced speech R&D lab in Kendall Square that they're growing. So revolution number two starts with this guy, Edwin Land, founder of Polaroid. Some people still remember Polaroid in the audience? All right, a lot of people still remember Polaroid. So uh, Land was a two-time Harvard dropout, uh, but despite that, a brilliant chemist and a really inspired inventor. He was on vacation in New Mexico uh, with his family, and he was taking all these pictures. And at one point, his daughter asked him, you know, Dad, you're taking all these pictures. Could I see them right now? Like, why, why can't you just show me all these pictures you're taking? And Land says that he walked around for about an hour in Santa Fe thinking about that question. Like, why can't I show my daughter these pictures? And then at the end of the hour, he had all the pieces in place in his mind for what would become the Polaroid instant camera, uh, first introduced in 1947. Polaroid became a giant global company. Uh, Steve Jobs actually said many times that his personal hero was, was Edwin Land. Uh, the Polaroid camera led to great art by people like Andy Warhol and Dorothea Lange. 
Uh, and I would also argue Polaroid sort of created this expectation that every picture you take, you're going to be able to see right after it, maybe make some adjustments a la Instagram, and share it with not just your friends at the party, you know, handing around the Polaroid, but now we can share it globally. And I'll point out that some of the colors in that Instagram app icon are really an homage to Polaroid's corporate colors. So kind of looking back uh, to the 1940s in Cambridge. Uh, so this movie in 1939, uh, it did not win the Best Picture Oscar, this movie about a girl and her shoes made out of rubies. Some of you may have seen this. Uh, instead, this movie about a woman and her dress made out of curtains won the Best Picture <laughs> Oscar that year, Gone with the Wind. It's kind of a racy picture of Scarlett O'Hara. They'll have to censor this for the uh, later YouTube archiving. Uh, and 1939, I look at it as the tipping point when Hollywood finally said, okay, color has arrived, color looks beautiful, and we're going to start making all of our movies in color versus black and white. And we wouldn't have had that revolution if it weren't for the Technicolor Motion Picture Corporation, which was founded in Boston, Massachusetts uh, by two graduates of MIT, another guy who didn't go to college, that's a bad message. This whole talk is filled with bad messages. I didn't realize this until I'm seeing all the kids in the audience. Stay in school, kids. Uh, so 1914, Technicolor Motion Picture Corporation, their idea was that movies, which were really hot in the early part of the 20th century, were not always destined to be in black and white. They felt like movies should reflect the colors of the world around us. Their first office was in a railroad car. Uh, and they had a film processing lab in the railroad car so that you could hitch it to a train and send it anywhere in the country that they were making a movie. Like, please, make your movie with Technicolor. We'll make it easy. We'll send our office to you. Um, so they raised a lot of rounds of money from a lot of different investors. They found partners like Walt Disney, who actually won his first Academy Award for this Technicolor movie, Flowers and Trees, in 1932. Um, Douglas Fairbanks made an early movie in Technicolor, and that led us to 1939, the tipping point. And today, if you go to see a movie in black and white, you're sort of making a conscious choice of, I'm going to go look for a movie in black and white. It's pretty hard to find. So um, my son is kind of a big Minecraft fan. I don't know if there are Minecraft players in the audience or a set. All right, let's hear it from Minecraft. Uh, or <laughs> Assassin's Creed players in the audience. But you know, if you love playing video games, um, that's another revolution that started in Boston in 1962. Um, these guys are at MIT. They have a Massachusetts-made digital equipment mini computer, the PDP-1. They are probably supposed to be doing something else with this mini computer. <laughs> and what do they do? But they create the first video game, Space War, which was kind of eventually led to asteroids. So it was sort of a primitive version of asteroids where you'd sh you were in a spaceship, you were shooting all kinds of stuff, flying around in outer space. Today, the video game industry around the world is a $90 billion industry. Um, and I think you can make the case that we've actually shifted from Hollywood being our central entertainment industry here in the United States to it being video games. In fact, I was reading that this summer, um, Call of Duty Black Ops 3 had a better opening weekend than the summer's biggest blockbuster, Jurassic World. Um, so really an interesting shift that started in 1962 right here. <coughs> Companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft are really interested in augmented reality and virtual reality all of a sudden. Uh, I don't know if you saw Google sent out with the New York Times, their Google Cardboard viewers earlier this month to sort of introduce New York Times readers to virtual reality. I think it's fascinating that all the biggest tech companies are competing with each other to try to hire the most attractive female models to show that virtual reality is not nerdy in any way. <laughs> it is sexy. Remember this picture. Not nerdy, sexy. Um, but if you go back and you look at the, the roots of virtual reality, well, these guys are maybe not so sexy. Uh, the roots of virtual reality are here at Harvard MIT. This, this demo on the left was an early VR AR demo called the Sword of Damocles. It was so heavy that they had to hang it from the ceiling. Otherwise, it would like crush your spine uh, if you put it on. But you could, you could sort of enter this virtual world, a virtual room, and look around and see the environment around you. Pretty amazing for 19, uh, the early 1960s. On the right, in the 1990s, MIT had this group of uh, students and researchers who were thinking about wearable computing in the mid-90s. And you could see them walking around Cambridge with these, with these outfits on. Google, interestingly, hired a couple of these guys to develop Google Glass. So VR, AR started here as well. 
Uh, even before we invented the word robot in 1920, we've been thinking about, wouldn't it be great to have these machines who could do the dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks for us, from Rosie the Robot Maid to R2-D2 and C-3PO? And when you look at the robots that are actually out there in the real world, the robots that are moving around uh, in factories and in warehouses and on battlefields, a surprising number of them are made by Boston companies like iRobot and Rethink Robotics. Uh, Kiva Systems, which makes these orange warehouse bots uh, on the right there, was acquired by Amazon and is now deploying those robots to all the Amazon warehouses around the world. Um, so robotics is a revolution that started here, I would argue, uh, and has continued this idea of robots outside of the factory, not bolted down. Finally, biotechnology is a wave that began in the 1970s as we started understanding how to decipher and read our own DNA. Um, it continued when we uh, started thinking about how do you manufacture these protein-based drugs that can, um, that can cure all kinds of complex diseases. Well, my monitor is still working here. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Even now in 2015, uh, you have these companies working on gene editing. I don't know if you've heard yet about gene editing, but this idea that you could actually do kind of cut and copy and paste uh, with your DNA and get rid of a, of a potentially fatal disease, not just in you, but in all of your descendants. Um, so Boston really is a center of gravity right now for cutting edge science, lots of money from venture capitalists and big pharma companies, and also people with the expertise who understand how to get science out of the lab and into the marketplace. So we started by talking about this rivalry, but when Boston obsesses about a city and sort of compares itself endlessly to a city, um, it's more often San Francisco these days and the Silicon Valley area. And I feel like it would be great for us to get beyond these comparisons and sort of think about what is Boston's unique contribution to the world in the 21st century, as opposed to saying, oh, we used to have digital equipment and now they have Apple and what, you know, woe is us. So, um, Boston is really an amazing place. I think we don't really communicate well um, what the value is that we're trying to bring to the world. If you mention to people, if you say uh, Las Vegas, if you say Wall Street, if you say Hong Kong, people instantly know kind of what are those cities about. And uh, I think when you talk to people outside of the Boston region, you say, what does Boston represent? What is Boston's identity in 2015? A lot of times you get Harvard and history. You know, those are the two associations with Boston. And I think we can do a better job of communicating, um, communicating what we are. Boston has always been the city that just does a really good job of blending young and old and established and entrepreneurial, newcomers and natives. I think some of this is aspirational. You know, there have been times in Boston's history and we've done a good job of leading on race and, and blending gender and class and religion and marriage equality and all of that stuff. Um, I think we can always aspire to do better, but, but sort of position ourselves as a city that blends. And if you try to sort of sum it all up in, in one idea or one sentence, I think it would be this. You know, we're at this point in our history where we have so many pressing problems that we need to solve, whether it's economic inequality, whether it's human disease, whether it's uh, terrorism, whether it's climate change. And this is a city that I think does a really good job of attracting both students and investors and big companies like Shell and Google and Apple and Johnson and Johnson that all want to be here to tap into our brain power. Um, but we need to focus on doing a better job of communicating why we're here and what we're trying to do. I think that um, in wrapping up here, the American Revolution wasn't just about throwing crates of tea into the harbor or battling the redcoats. We had to create the legal and political infrastructure for the country that we were going to become. So I think when we talk about innovation and what we're trying to do with innovation, a lot of it is about um, being, at, being active and speaking out about certain policy issues, things like immigration, and allowing students that come here to get degrees to stick around afterwards if they want to and be contributors. It's about federal funding of basic science and scientific research and making sure that doesn't dry up. Uh, it's about talent mobility and making sure people can move from one company to another or can leave a big company to start a small company without worried about get, worrying about uh, being sued. And finally, it's about things like the first robotics competition, thinking about new ways to get kids excited about careers in STEM. And it's, it's not just about teaching them STEM topics in the classroom, but like first, bringing it out into the world and making it exciting and making it a big part of the culture. Um, so I really think we need to lead. If we're going to be the world's R&D lab, we need to lead on preparing the kids of today, the kids in our community, 
for these jobs that are going to be very demanding and very brain power intensive in the future. So this is not the world's first drone photo, uh, but it is the world's first aerial photo, or the oldest surviving aerial photo from 1860. And it's a picture of Boston from about 2,000 uh, 2, feet up. And I wanted to end on this because I feel like sometimes uh, we in Boston get stuck at the street level, you know, all the street level detail. If you ever walked around or drive around Bo downtown Boston, it's very easy to get lost in the chaos there. Um, we need to take a balloon's eye view or a bird's eye view of where we're going and what we're about. So I think we need to be clear. We are the world's R&D lab. And if you want to solve really tough problems, we want you here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>